Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm excited. We have John Dwyer, JD, who's one of the top marketing experts and founder of the Institute of Wow. He's been called the Seinfeld guy because he scored huge by getting Jerry Seinfeld as a spokesman for a client he had in Australia. And Jerry had only done two other advertising campaigns up until then for American Express and Microsoft. JD has advised McDonald's, KFC, Westfield, and many others. And he's also worked closely with Walt Disney and Warner Brothers Entertainment Empires in Australia. He's created marketing that has generated hundreds of millions of dollars in sales for his clients. And to give you an idea of JD's campaigns that resulted in an avalanche of responses, one, only one of his marketing responses or his marketing concepts generated over 804,000 phone calls in just one week. JD, thanks for joining me. Hi, Jeremy. My pleasure. So I have so much to ask you, but I have to ask about that. Tell me about that marketing concept. 804,000 in one week. In little old Australia down under. Yeah. Uh, Jeremy, uh, what I've been involved in over many years is what uh, I would term as avalanche marketing. And that's getting a big avalanche response very quickly. And of course, that's all built around direct response tactics. And yeah. that particular 800 odd thousand calls in one week was a bingo game um, that one of the magazines um, sort of joined with me. Uh, so we joined forces and one of the big lady or women magazines here in Australia is called New Idea. And so we put uh, one and a half million bingo cards into the New Idea and uh, people had to ring up a 1800 number to get their bingo numbers each day. And so when we got uh, something like 150,000 phone calls on the first day, because you know, all of these women who were buying the magazine got the bingo card, they wanted to know what numbers to scratch out to see if they could win the $50,000, they rang up and the recording would say, today's numbers are 6, 11, 12, whatever it may be. Mm. And then at midnight that night, they the number routine would click over to Tuesday's numbers and they'd have to ring up again and get Tuesday's numbers and then they'd have to do the same on Wednesday and Thursday. So over the whole week, whoever rang on the Monday rang six more times throughout the week to get their bingo numbers. Mm, very smart. They have to keep coming back. Had to keep coming back. And look, although that particular example wouldn't necessarily resonate specifically with any of your um, listeners or people watching us on Skype. The takeout from that is um, build repetitive trade. Uh, I teach people how not to get one sale because you don't want just one sale. The whole idea is to actually build loyalty so that you get a customer for life. Yeah. So how did you come up with that? Um, I was going to tell you I'd pull it out of somewhere, but that would be rude. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, oh, look, really, at the end of the day, uh, I, many years ago, I was the bingo king here in Australia. And so, therefore, um, all of the News Limited, Rupert Murdoch newspapers would knock on my door. Uh, all the radio stations would knock on my door and ask if I could stimulate repetitive um, uh, purchasing for the newspapers or repetitive listening if it happened to be a radio station. So yeah. I'd do the same thing for radio stations as well. And what I believe a lot of the big media do which is just silly is that they preach to the converted so if you're listening to a radio station doesn't matter whether it's in texas or los angeles or sydney they promote all of their um music and they promote all of their content on their own radio station right <laughs> and uh, i taught them how to look outside the box and put brochures into everyone's letterbox in sydney and they had to listen to the radio station, of course, to get the numbers for their bingo card or whatever it may be. So mm -hmm. I actually teach people how to get an avalanche response by yeah. looking outside their normal customer base. Yeah. And so you've, you've created your own recipe for attracting an, avalan you know, an avalanche response of new clients and you call it the wheel of wow? The wheel of wow. That's so, a really wanky, Yeah. Explain really wanky, what it is. A, a very wanky name, isn't it? Yes. Okay, the wheel of wow. And thank you for saying yes so quickly, by the way. Um, <laughs> yeah, Jeremy, look, it's a, it's a corny name, um, but there's nothing corny about it. I've called it the wheel of wow. And I've, I've done that because for particularly small and medium sized businesses, I've got to be careful that I don't go down the marketing speak path and start, you know, using too many silly marketing terms. And so therefore, I've made it nice and easy for smaller businesses to understand. And I've broken up this wheel just picture a wheel into five segments and those five segments really are very very simple number one know your most profitable target audience mm -hmm. not your 
target audience, but your most profitable segment of that target, target audience. Because once you know that if your most profitable segment are women aged 40 through to 60 years of age and they're more likely a white collar worker and they have 2.3 children and they live in one of the upper suburbs, then of course you just need to look for more people who look like them. Simple as that. So number one, find your most profitable target audience. Number two, create a wow factor to take their eyes off the price. The last thing you want anyone to be doing, no matter what product or service you have, is to be buying on price. Why? Because you can have a discount once or twice a year, but it's not sustainable for most of us 52 weeks a year. And if you're a little um, corner store and you're up against Walmart and you think you're going to beat them on price, well, I've got news for you. So you need to create a wow factor. And I often say, Jeremy, that um, in my instance, I've got six children and they're 17 to late 20s now. So they're too old for McDonald's Happy Meal toys now. But when they, we had six under 12, I bought $5 billion worth of Happy Meals and I thought about the Disney toy. Had nothing to do with the hamburgers. The kids threw the hamburger out. It was all about McDonald's taking our eyes off the price onto that Disney toy to shut the kids up in the back of the car. Yes, yes. So that's what creating a wow does. It takes their eyes off the price. And the third component of this wheel of wow is what I call the problem solution scenario. Mm -hmm. And if you want people to buy your product or service, it doesn't matter what it is, you need to highlight their problem and then give them your solution. Mm -hmm. And Neurofen do that beautifully. And I've just been to the United States just before Christmas to go to a wedding uh, in Los Angeles and I saw a lot of Neurofen. Uh, and by the way, I've, I've been to the US a hundred times, so I love your country. I just, yeah, I, if you're an ideas person like me, you know, your country is the place to go. Um, but anyway, yes, I was there before Christmas and um, I would watch a Neurofen uh, headache tablet on TV. They would show the lady coming home uh, after picking the children up from school. She's in the kitchen and the kids are going mad and just oh, out of control. And she's got a headache, so she rubs her forehead and then she opens up the kitchen drawer, puts a tablet in her mouth, a Neurofen, takes a glass of water. We see it come down into her tummy and bounce back up again. And a little clock on the screen tells you that the headache's gone in 15 minutes. Mm. The camera pans around to all those little rat children who are now well behaved. <laughs> Problem, solution. Right, right. I call it the Neurofen effect. So the three components so far is identify your most profitable target audience. Number two, create a wow to take their eyes off the price. Number three, use the problem solution scenario. And number four is fix your broken website. Because I can assure you in the game that I'm in, I've got both international and Australian clients. 90% of the clients when they come on board have a woeful, awful, disgusting website. Hmm. And the reason is because it's been designed most likely by an artist or a website designer, we call them these days. And they're great at maybe looking at making it look pretty, but whether it converts into sales is another thing. Mm -hmm. And so I teach people a whole lot of components that they need to have, particularly on their homepage, um, on their website so that it converts. If I was to say to you, Jeremy, what was the most important page of a magazine in the drugstore? What would you say is the most important page? I'm assuming the cover. You got it. Yeah. And yet and yet, the funny part about it is, is that most websites don't, uh, well, most owners of websites don't acknowledge the same principle works online. If you've got a crummy homepage, right. and most people do, then your bounce rate is likely to be 50, 60, 70, 80%, which means yeah. people are bouncing off before they go anywhere else, and you ain't ever going to convert. Mm -hmm. So I teach them the components of the homepage, definitely the homepage that they need to do. And the last uh, component of that fifth, uh, of that five part wheel of wow, is repetitive trade and uh, we touched on that at the beginning i just teach people how to actually build loyalty schemes so that they get mm -hmm. uh, customers coming back more and more and more yeah and jd it's sort of unique for a marketing firm to not use a lot you know more direct response than branding and i find that to be refreshing how did you decide okay i'm not going to go with this the stereotypical branding aspect but i'm going to do the direct response more uh model um i just believe they don't need to be mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. I believe that you can do both at the same time. And so uh, if I'm in a seminar mode, and uh, and by the way, I'm not a seminar speaker per se. I've come from a corporate background helping some of those bigger businesses. And uh, what I've done in the last few years is I've set up my business to have a lot of webinars and seminars because a lot of smaller businesses were knocking on my door and um, I couldn't service them when I was looking after McDonald's here in Australia or Coca-Cola or 7-Eleven and places like that. I didn't yeah. have the time to service them. So I've cut my intellectual property up into bite-sized pieces now to make it available for smaller businesses. Yeah. And what I do when I am doing a seminar is that I ask everybody, uh, anybody here has ever bought anything off the side of a bus, the advertisements on the side of a bus? Nobody. 
Anybody here bought anything off an advertisement on the back of a taxi, a cab? Nobody. Well, has anybody bought anything off the side of a billboard uh, doing a you know, hundred miles an hour, or hundred kilometres an hour, I should say, uh, down the freeway? No. Now, McDonald's four minutes ahead makes a lot of sense on that billboard, but for most of us, we don't buy hair shampoo off the billboard on the freeway. Right. And then I say, well, listen, at the grand final of the Australian Football League last year, we had 101,000 people in the stadium. I will give $100. I normally put $100 in the air in front of the seminar crowd. I say, I'll give $100 to anyone who can tell me who the sponsor was on the back of one of the two teams playing the grand final. Nobody. <laughs> So what I'm saying is that that sort of branding for little businesses, I, you know, McDonald's can afford to throw it up against the wall and if it works, it works. And if it doesn't, they'll say, oh, we'll build our brand. But for smaller businesses that are doing 300,000, 500,000, a million, 2 million, 5 million or 10 million, they haven't got that sort of resources to right. just best guess that that branding is going to work. I believe you actually need to have direct response marketing that you spend money today and get a result tomorrow, but bring your brand. Your brand can come along with it. There's nothing wrong with still branding right. because I buy Kellogg's because of the brand. But if Kellogg's actually didn't have the toy in that box, there'd be a lot of parents out there that wouldn't be buying Kellogg's. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to hear about your background and you know, you know, from how you got to where you are. But I always like to include a fun fact, JD, and a fun fact which you mentioned is you have six kids. Yes. Yep. So how do you balance having family, six kids, with all these campaigns and business and having your own company? Uh, a lot of psychiatric uh, <laughs> consultancy. Yes. yes. Um, and Jeremy, look, three of mine have left home now. We've got uh, 17 and a uh, 19 and a 20 year old boys are still home, but uh, three of them have sort of left the nest. So it's not quite as crazy yeah. as it used to be. Um, but throughout those years of having, yeah, yeah, six children, particularly when they were younger in the, you know, eight, nine, 10, 14 age group. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was what was it like when they were younger and you have six? A nightmare. What's a that? Nightmare. A nightmare. A nightmare. Yeah. And I, I used to do a lot of work with the Walt Disney Company. I'd take out licenses for doing stickers and bubblegum cards and, uh, and, and, and books and posters. In fact, I've got to show you this. I, I had this just on the floor of my office because I thought you might give me the opportunity to show off. But back in the years that I was doing Disney, I actually produced this big poster and I'm going to show it to you. I, nice. think, you, I think you can see it on the screen. Yeah, there, you can see it, yeah. Yeah, so that is, um, that is all the Disney characters coming down Main Street all at once. Now, that particular poster, Walt Disney's daughter, um, Diane Miller, bought one of these off me, would you believe it? Wow. Um, and she actually so you gave created that. Yeah, I created that. We well, I did the sketch in the beginning, but the artist actually uh, put it all together. Wow. Uh, but yeah, it's quite a spectacular poster. And the reason I I, I put that up is a to show off because I'm a show off. Um, <laughs> uh, B to be able to drop the Disney daughter name, so that was handy. Um, she saw it in a magazine over in America because I had a Disney fan club buy quite a few of the posters off me, and she actually didn't ask me; she asked them. Could she buy? This is Diane Disney Miller, who just passed away last year, and uh, she said to them that was the best Disney poster she had ever seen. Would you wow. believe? Um, but the reason I bring that up, third reason, other than showing off and dropping Walt Disney's daughter's name, was because uh, I used to do a lot of that stuff with Disney, and uh, and I used to have to fly backwards and forwards to Burbank uh, to visit their office. And can you imagine when you've got six kids under twelve? Daddy saying to the kids, "Look, I'm going to America for a week to visit Walt Disney. You stay here." Right. Uh, so Chaos. it cost me a fortune every time I had a meeting in Los Angeles. It would cost me a fortune. Mm -hmm. And if you saw the look on everyone's face when we walked into that Qantas airplane um, for a 14-hour flight to Los Angeles with the Von Trapp family, can you imagine the death stares we used to get? <laughs> so, yes, it was a nightmare, um, but a great nightmare that I'd live. Uh, every parent would say the same thing. They'd do it all over again. Of course I would. Um, but I think... Probably I ran so fast because, you know, when you've got six kids under 12, your wife can't work, you've got one income, so you've got to run fast. <laughs> Very fast. Um, but I guess, look, the the thing, I was always a, an artist, I was always a, a sketcher, and so therefore I think if you've come from a background where you can visualise things because you can draw, there's a pretty strong chance that um, you're going to want to commercialise that. And I could see in my younger days that uh, this thing called a computer was coming along and that you know the ability to draw would not be as valuable as it used to be. So I better learn a skill around that creativity mm -hmm. where I could actually put food on the table. And of course, mm -hmm. what that is is marketing. Yeah. So what was it like growing up? Where are you from? 
Uh, I grew up in a typical uh, Irish descent Catholic family um, in Sydney, in a, in a regular working class suburb in Sydney. Um, I only just lost my parents last year at the, mm. the ripe old age of 89. And Sorry so therefore, yeah, they had a great yeah. innings. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we grew up in a typical working class family. I'm one of three, um, three boys. You wouldn't believe it, the irony is that um, my mum was a dressmaker and she had three boys. <laughs> and did we get sick of wearing those dresses? <laughs> <laughs> I want to, I'm going to like link a picture up at the end of this. Yeah, I don't think I've got one of those. I've only got the Disney poster. Okay. Right um, yeah, so it was just a normal, regular family and uh, we had a great upbringing. But Dad was a telephone technician, so it was a pretty, uh, work, you know, pretty much working class family and we didn't, gosh, when my kids look back and hopefully talk about me in the years to come, they've been to Disneyland, you know, 20 times and they've been around the world and all these sorts of things. Uh, and now I'm glad that I could have sort of afforded to give that to them. But in our instance, our holidays, our vacations from Sydney were probably an hour away. <laughs> I drive up the freeway and that was about it. But a lovely upbringing and uh, went to the normal sort of Catholic schools. And I think I broke the record for getting the most leather straps. For Somehow smoking I'm not it. doubting that. <laughs> <laughs> for, smoke, for smoking outside the shelter shed or whatever it was at the time. So how did you get into marketing then? I uh, ran about the age of, uh, again, because I could sketch and draw throughout my latter years, my best subjects were English and art. Uh, I wasn't too flash at sciences and maths, and that's just the right brain working, I guess. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, I um, I went to uh, do my advertising and marketing degree at university after I left school. Mm -hmm. And uh, fortunately, in that instance, despite the fact that I did wag quite a few days of uni, like we all did, um, I ended up coming out with reasonable marks. And uh, whilst I... Um, I guess yeah, they're reasonably humble beginnings, but there was a big Westfield style shopping center here in Sydney that I ended up becoming the promotions manager at in my early 20s. And uh, because uh, I was creative, um, uh, but at the same time, I blew their budget because whatever their budget was for the year, I think I blew in a couple of months, um, typical right brain person. Um, I think it was that reason they gave me the head job in at the head office of Woolworths to become their national marketing guy. I don't think it was because of my skill. I don't think they could afford to leave me at the shopping center. So what did you learn at Woolworths? Because you were head of the national sales there, right? Yeah, so there, for Woolworths, uh, to give you guys a feeling for Woolworths, see, I know you've got the brand there, but it's a different sort of business here. Okay. Woolworths are, one of the, are the two, they're one of two major supermarket chains here in Australia. And uh, they are one of the biggest businesses in Australia. So it's a major, major supermarket chain. And um, they owned around about 30 or 40 shopping malls around Australia. Wow. And uh, so therefore, I was responsible for pretty much putting together the annual marketing plan for them. And when I was at Woolworths, it was a great opportunity because you're working with a company with a fair budget to test a lot of the things that these days I'm showing smaller businesses. Um, you guys would be familiar with this because your supermarket chains have done the same thing. You, you might recall where it was a stamp collection program where for every five or ten dollars that you spent at the supermarket you had a stamp and you licked it and put it onto what we call a saver sheet and when you saved up x number of stamps which meant you may have spent fifty dollars over the course of the two weeks you could cash that in for a, a, a glassware or cookware mm -hmm. at a ridiculously low price and so therefore the women particularly ladies i mean it really wasn't a men's thing but women are the target audience for supermarkets they would collect a whole set of glasses over a period of the three months that the promotion was running. Mm -hmm. And normally they would have paid $200 for the glasses and the nice big water jug and everything else that goes with the set, or it might've been a dinnerware set. They would normally pay 150 to $200 for it, but by saving the stamps, in other words, shopping at Woolworths, they got the whole thing for $50. Mm -hmm. Got it. And uh, then I got involved in doing a lot of the big scratch promotions uh, for Woolworths, which just skyrocketed trade like crazy. and. At that point, probably in my mid twenties, I thought, mm, "There's something to this artificial stimulus that, uh, that that that's really benefiting this supermarket chain. I might leave and set up a business that I provide that on mass to other people, which is what I did." Mm. So, what made you decide to finally branch out on your own? Because it's not an easy decision to make. No, it's not. And look, it scared the daylights out of. Uh, uh, I think probably now my wife, but she may have been my fiance at the time because I think she um, was hoping she was going to marry into a stable existence. Well, she got that wrong. <laughs> Her fault, not mine. Yeah. Um, and look, I'm the typical entrepreneur. So look, I've had my roller coaster ride. You know, we've made the millions and lost the millions, and thankfully got back up again, which is good. Um, but uh, and every entrepreneur story is that. Um, mm -hmm. So there's nothing wrong with it. That's just the life cycle of an entrepreneur most of the time. Right. Um, 
yeah, what made me get into it, really, I just felt that I was getting to a stage where um, I was probably unemployable in the sense that I was challenging a lot of the decisions that uh, my employer, Woolworths, you know, yeah. were, were making. And that doesn't make me right, by the way. I'm not saying for any moment that I was particularly back at that age in my 20s. I'm not saying I was right. But I found that maybe if I was sort of hitting my head up against a brick wall um, with a big organisation, with a you know set of management and directors that you know took three months to get any idea done, yeah. it might be worth dipping my toe into the water of setting up my own thing. So I wasn't silly. I didn't leave before I set this up and did it at night time. And I, I would advise anyone who's younger, who might yeah. be at college or university, watching this, please. Um, create a business on the side and make sure it works before you leave your stable employment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So how did you get your first clients when you struck out on your own? Yeah, mate, um, look, pretty much what I preach these days, there's maybe the delivery system with, you know, emails these days might be a bit different. But uh, in those days, which was some years ago, um, it was sending out a direct mail campaign. Mm to um, small to medium-sized businesses. I knew that you know, my best chance would be businesses that were relatively modest in size uh, because I don't think you know, Coca-Cola would want to just you know, put me on at that time. Um, and that's what I did. I just would send out a direct mail piece. And it's as simple as this right now for anyone who is listening to this. It's simply a numbers game. I would send out 100 letters and I might get oh, eight inquiries and I could convert half of them. So for every 100 letters, I worked out I could get four clients. So if I wanted eight clients, I'd send out 200 letters. And you know what? I don't want to make it sound too simple because there's a little bit of science behind this. But yeah. nonetheless, that's as easy as it is even today. What did you offer at the time to the clients? Um, uh, very good point. Really, really good point. Um, Jeremy, I, my kids, um, those who are in their 20s now, um, but even the 17 and 19 and 20-year-old, um, not one of them listened to me, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I try to convince them. Uh, and they come back about the 20, I've got one 25 and 27. They come back around about that age group when they can see a mortgage might be around the corner. We better listen to that. You know? yeah. um, but up until then, uh, when there's no compulsion for them to listen, it's, oh, Dad, what would you know? Um, but I try and say to them, hang around with people who have an X factor. Don't necessarily hang around with people who've just got a book of contacts because really, if people say to me, oh, how did you get Michael Jordan or Princess Di or Jerry Seinfeld to work with you? I just say I contacted them. Now, yes, I had to contact them and contact them and contact them, but basically I contacted them. Nobody gave them to me in a contact book and went, so, you know, what? I know Jerry Seinfeld. No one did that. Right. So I say to my kids, um, and the reason I'm bringing this up because I think it's important when you say, well, you know, how did you get clients? I showed them that I had an X factor. I said to them in the letters, when I sent the letters out, look, I believe I can do this, 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 and this for you. You won't get that at an advertising agency. You'll just be a number because your size business really isn't on the radar for an advertising agency anyway. You're too yeah. small. I can deliver that personal service to you. And guess what? I believe I can give you this, 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 and this. And that's why I'm trying to tell the kids. I said, hang around people with an X factor. Don't hang around people who've just got a book of contacts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what was, when you started, after you started, what was the next big milestone for your business? Um, yeah, I guess the well, the next big the big milestone for me when I did kick off was getting the club industry on board here in Australia as a as, well. When I say the club industry, a number of clubs from that industry as clients, and so that you understand what a club is, it's a mini casino from Vegas. Hmm. Okay, so we have in the east coast of Australia a lot of big uh, football teams. Okay, what we call rugby league teams, right. and they're really funded by the slot machines in these casino style clubs. Oh, wow. And so these clubs, for example, uh, I live on the Gold Coast here in Australia, and we might have a club that has, you know, 50, 60,000 members, and it's not unusual for them to have um, Neil Sadaka on on Saturday night. They have all the big shows from overseas, and what they do is that they will put that show on to draw people in to play the slot machines. And so, therefore, what happened is that I zeroed in on that industry because I knew they had a lot of money to spend but not a lot of marketing expertise, and I sent a lot of my mail campaigns out to them, mm -hmm. showing them that I could help spin their slot machines if mm -hmm. they were to, you know, basically put my promotions on. Yeah. And I got a few runs on the board because it worked very well. So for the first three or four years of my business by myself, I looked after providing marketing concepts that would spin the wheels on the slot machines for clubs. Nice. So what did you help do, do for them? Okay, so what I would do is that uh, when you went to the bar to buy a drink, um, because we wanted you to play the slot machine, we would give you a little scratch ticket. 
and that little scratch ticket might be called something. I'm embarrassed to say what it is now. I think it was called Pokey Power, as in poker machine power. Pokey Power. I can't believe I was so. <laughs> um, anyway, so they would then get this, and on the little scratch card would be a picture of a poker machine with the four or five, you know, sort of reels that come around. Right. You scratch them out, mm -hmm. and we would say, uh, if you got king, queen, any, 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 you go, oh wow. Um, you'd go to the poker machine, and if you brought that up, you would win $100. Mm. Well, guess what? You thought the king, queen, any, any, any was so easy to get, but it was one in you know 142,000 chance that you would bring that up. Right. And, of course, uh, we would design the scratch card so that all of the symbols that you scratched out looked like they were really easy to get, but they weren't. And so we would just send the poker machines, or what you guys call slot machines, um, mm -hmm. revenue through the roof. Love it. Through the roof. Yeah. So after the slot machines, what was the next big milestone for your business? Okay, okay. Well, what I decided then was that because this um, direct response um, avalanche marketing stuff was working, I would just go further afield. So what I did was that I just did exactly the same mail campaigns um, or I put in inserts into industry magazines for things like shopping centers, like shopping malls. Um, and so I picked a lot of them up. Uh, the Retail Traders Association, which meant they were, you know, blockbuster style video stores or they may have been butcheries or bakeries. Uh, and so therefore I would put a leaflet. So for argument's sake, I would put, I'm trying to see if I've got, uh, yeah. So I would put a leaflet like that. That happens to be one we're running at the moment, which is a fuel discount promotion. That would go into a trade magazine. And what would happen is that uh, that trade magazine might be the retail traders magazine. It goes mm. out to uh, 32,000 retailers. That would fall out of the magazine and they'd ring our office and say, look, what's the, I'd, I'd like to learn more about this promotion. And mm. I would do that for industry after industry, clubs, hotels, retailers, shopping malls, car dealerships, video chains. And what I found was that it was easy peasy because whatever I developed for one industry, I only had to tweak a little bit to sell to the car dealership industry or to the video industry. Yeah. So where did you learn this? This is not simple stuff. This is, you know, somewhat sophisticated direct response. Did you have a mentor? Were you learning from, where did you learn it? Um, uh, look, a lot of it trial and error, Jeremy. I mean, yes, I, you know, my mentors were more likely on the, uh, creative side of the fence that weren't necessarily into direct response. So my mentors have been people like Spielberg or Lucas or Disney and, you know, people like that, which anybody who's of a creative mindset is probably going to give you the same names. Yeah. But most of this stuff, keep in mind, I did do my four years um, university college course with advertising and marketing, but most of that left me a little empty because it was all about branding. It was all about sponsoring uh, big sporting events or sporting teams and it was all about jingles that had a rhyme you know, I, I had a client, which I know you're probably going to touch on, at the Greater Building Society. And before I got there um, and changed it, uh, their advertising agency was spending a fortune on television and radio with a jingle. Now, keep in mind, it's called the Greater, the Greater Building Society. And their jingle that ran throughout the entire 30-second ad on TV was, sooner or later, it's the Greater. <laughs> Excuse me whilst I do that. Um and so, therefore, if you don't have... You always wonder who's sitting around in a room who comes up with these things. Well, you know whoever came up with it did this, by the way. <laughs> so, the point is, um, yeah, the point is, is that mostly the ponytailed creatives from an advertising agency will come up with that after they've just mm. been, I don't know, smoking something or drinking something. And they've said sooner or later it's the greater. But what's even more tragic is the client, who is a bank, run by intelligent people actually signed off on that yeah um and so therefore really what i ended up doing is moving away from um supporting the brand only advertising yeah. and recognizing that i had to create something for my clients that was going to be more measurable and more measurable means direct response mm -hmm. so how did they end up finding you the bank uh, yeah, well, they, they, that one was an interesting one. What happened is that the bank, uh, which, you guys have got credit unions and building societies as well, so you're pretty familiar what a building society is, but for those that don't, it's basically a bank. Mm -hmm. um, they, had, uh, they had been looking for a marketing manager to replace one that they had at the time and uh, weren't finding it easy to find someone who was very different from the ad agency that they currently had. So they sort of knew that their advertising wasn't working but they didn't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. They still kept the advertising agency until they found someone that might think a little differently. Mm -hmm. So they actually put an ad in the paper 
uh, and uh, and I think, well, gosh, this was back in 2000, so it was online as well, but let's say paper and online. And I wasn't looking for any full-time jobs, of course. I had my own agency. Um, and the girl that worked for me said, JD, have a look at this. And it said, Greater Building Society looking for an innovative marketing manager who thinks outside the square, blah, blah, blah. And so I threw my head in the ring. And when I went to visit them, they're good friends now. I, I don't consult them anymore. I gave it up a couple of years ago after 10 years. But um, I, I'm good friends with the number one and number two um, who have also left the building society now. But they said to me at the time when I rolled up with all of my weird direct response ideas, firstly, with the amount of stuff that I had done up until that time, so this was back in 2000, they thought I must have been 104 because they couldn't work out how anyone could squeeze all that stuff in, which was a nice compliment. Yeah. Uh, but I told them I had to feed six kids, so I had to run fast. Yeah. Um, and the other thing was is that they were very much um, excited because they could see that this was diametrically the opposite to where they had been wasting their money up until then. Yeah. And so, therefore, the first thing I did was make the advertising agency accountable uh, where they didn't want to be accountable. They just wanted to come up with jingles that rhymed. Right. And once I brought that to town, uh, the agency ran the other way real quick. They ended up moving away from the account and giving it up, and we, we got a new agency that was more direct response uh, sort of targeted. Yeah. So, you know, J.D., before we even talk about Jerry Seinfeld and landing him, how did that even come up in the realm of people that you were searching for? Yes. Because you okay. could pick anyone. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, how that happened is that when uh, I started at the agent, at the building society providing them with consultancy, so I never worked there. I would call in once every 10 days, but I basically looked after all their marketing. Um, so they, they had a team of seven or eight in their marketing department, and uh, I'd be the typical consultant. I'd roll into town and uh, have the meeting with them that day, uh, give them all lots of work to do, and then go, oh, it's five o'clock, I better go now. Um, so they did all the work, and I got the credit, which is fantastic. Um what I did was that I said to them, look, you're in a sea of sameness and every American bank is in the same sea of sameness as we speak. So I said to them, look, I've been doing some morning TV commercials for a vacation company, a travel company, and they can actually provide you with travel uh, giveaways for about 50% of what the retail price is. And they went, yeah, go on. And I said, well, I think I can sell some more home loans for you. And they, which is what they wanted to sell. Yeah. And I'm in a meeting with the boardroom table and I threw a Happy Meal box from McDonald's in the middle of the table. Now they knew I was a smart aleck, I'd been there for two or three months, so therefore they just went, yeah, okay, ha, 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 you've got our attention. And I pulled the little plastic Disney toy out and I said, this will sell more home loans. And they went, uh, we're gonna give away a Disney toy with that. What are you talking about? I said, no, it's a metaphor, okay? McDonald's have sold a lot of these Happy Meals because of the Disney toy. What I'm saying is that we've got to take their eye off the interest rate, home loan 6.2%, whatever it might be, and onto something that's a free giveaway. And I went, well, what would that be? I said, a vacation. So how we did it, we call vacations in Australia holiday. We came on TV, we said, swap your home loan from whatever nasty bank you're with, and you probably had a bad experience with them, swap it to the greater, and we'll give you a free holiday, a free vacation. Yeah. Do you know their home loans doubled within six months and tripled within 18 months? Wow. And not once in nine years did we ever mention interest rate. So the only bank in the world that said, get a home loan, get a free holiday, free vacation, mm -hmm. never ever did we bring up 6.2% or whatever the interest rate mm -hmm. is, and yet they quadrupled their business over that time. Yeah. We got to about 2009 when the Lehman Brothers thing in America and all the banks were falling over, and we decided we should rest the free vacation for a little while because it was it, it, it was a value-add gimmick, and so we thought we might, you know, and they said to me, look, um, we want to take our brand to another level. And so, therefore, you know, building societies and credit unions are normally working class. We want to get out of white-collar workers. And I said, well, there's probably one quick way of doing that, and that is to find an iconic celebrity or sports star mm -hmm. that can actually catapult you to that level very quickly. Yeah. And we put out our research and asked both members and non-members of the building society who would be a television or sporting personality or celebrity who would match the cheeky nature of their brand persona? And just my luck, Jerry Seinfeld came up on top. Perfect. I was hoping a little-known Australian entertainer. Yeah, why, why not a famous rugby player? Why couldn't I get someone that was going to cost me $30,000 and he'd answer his own phone? Yeah. So Seinfeld came up on top, and then I just thought, oh, my goodness, why did I get my – what did I get into here is if I'm going to be able to get Jerry Seinfeld – well, as it turned out, we took a while to chase him. It took six months to chase him down. He's the hardest. He's harder to get to than the Pope. And as it turned out, I uh, ended up going through George Shapiro, his 75-year-old manager. 
And uh, I sent an email to him and just said what we wanted to do. And I got the surprise of my life. I thought it was a gotcha phone call from someone taking the, you know, what out of me. But I get a phone call from a girl called Amy, and she says, hello, my name's Amy. I've got George Shapiro on the phone for you. And I thought it was a gag. So it took me two or three minutes into the phone call to realize it was the real George Shapiro. And he said, I quite like what you want to do. And I said, um, great. And he said, how about I put it to Jerry? I said, mate, that'd be fantastic. And two days later, I got an email to say, look, Jerry thinks it would be good fun to make fun of the banks. Let's do it. I mean, so Jerry probably gets thousands of emails, probably more. What did you put in the email that he thought, hmm, this seems like a good idea. I'm going to ask Jerry about it. Okay. The, the, the premise for the campaign was that Jerry would take uh, the you-know-what out of the banks. He'd, he'd, make, he'd take the mickey out of the banks because in the home loan business, and it would be the same in America, less than 6% of anyone who might be watching that ad um, or reading the ad in the paper uh, or seeing it online Less than 6% of Americans or Australians today are even remotely thinking about home loans. So what I did was widen that funnel, and this is a good example for anyone to do it in their own business, widen the funnel to more than 50% of people by saying if you're unhappy with your bank and they're treating you like a number, why don't you consider swapping your home loan to the Greater Building Society and who else you know, would be more influential than someone like Jerry Seinfeld because if he thinks they're good, well, they're good enough for me. Um, and when I said we dropped the holiday, we didn't. We only actually, we, we, we didn't seize the holiday until uh, till about halfway through the Seinfeld campaign. Mm-hmm. So what I did was that in the email to Jerry and to George Shapiro, I just said, listen, this is an opportunity for Jerry to be just Jerry. We don't want him to be anyone else. We don't want him to be role playing. We don't want him to hold up the product in front of the camera. All we want him to do is make fun of banks and then let people make up their own mind. Mm-hmm. Now, that's the clincher. If you're dealing with a Jim Carrey or George Clooney or, you know, Jerry Seinfeld or, or uh, God, love, God rest his soul, but Robin Williams, if you're dealing with any of those people, um, they want creative control and they don't want to be, you know, like the typical mm. Japanese yeah. holding the product. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's when I met with Jerry in New York, he said, I said, why do you do this? You've got more money than God. And uh, he just said, well, listen, number one, uh, I love Australians, you know, take the Mickey sense of humor. He said, I just love the way you guys, you know, basically just take the you know what out of each other right. and he said number two no one from australia has ever asked me before and he said number three you've given me creative control which yeah. was very important and yeah. he said so i figured it'd be a good it'd be good fun love it yeah so how was it working with him oh m- magnificent he's exactly like he is on the you know he, he argues whenever he's being interviewed by anyone that his tv show was just him that was him and he's dead right that was just him um he was just a really nice down-to-earth guy, and what you see is what you get, exactly what you see on the TV show. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, J.D., I want you to talk about some of the successful campaigns. Um, you talked about you know, the slot machines because you have several that are very interesting. Um, you worked with a lawn company. Uh, talk about some of your successful campaigns. Thank you, Dougie. Well, the lawn company is probably a good one, mate. Um, the... Uh, I mean, obviously, because of the profile um, of the get a home loan, get a free vacation and Seinfeld and all of that, uh, that Greater Building Society uh, one is, you know, an iconic campaign because, yeah. you know, we're talking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. So, therefore, that was a huge one. But on the level of perhaps where most of the audience who are watching and listening to this uh, come from, and maybe it's a much smaller um, business, um, some examples would be, yeah, one of them would be the turf farm. So this is um, uh, not far away from where I live on the Gold Coast in Australia. There's a mountain range called the Tambourine Mountains. And this particular chap had purchased a turf farm just at the end of the building boom a few years ago. A bit like you and me, he always gets in at the end of the boom. Don't you hate that? Um, so anyway, he uh, meets with me and he said, uh, look, uh, I've got six miles worth of grass, turf. And he said, you know, homes are not being built as fast as they were last year. So right. therefore, I'm stuck with it. And I said, well, who's your target audience? And he said, oh, look, I think we'll get away from the landscapers. And what we'll do is go straight to the public and we'll offer it to them. And I said, why? He said, well, the landscapers always barter on price. So if I'm $5 per square meter for my turf, then they'll argue they can get it down the road for $4.50. And then I've got to drop to $4.30. He said, I'd rather get out of that game yeah. and look for mum and dads who are just looking for a new front lawn. Yeah. And I said, well, you're an idiot um, because I, I talk very nicely to my clients. And uh, You say it in a nice way. You, you smile exactly. while, you, while you call someone an idiot, so it makes it better. Exactly. 
Exactly. And so he called me a moron and I called him something else. And we, yeah, I have this very instant um, rapport with my clients where we insult each other within the first five minutes. Yeah. So anyway, we had a bit of a giggle and I said, look, finding people who are just wanting to replace their front lawn or back lawn is like a needle in a haystack. How are we ever going to cost effectively reach those people? Yeah. Let's get back to where you get most of your easy money from, which is the landscape. He said, yeah, but they want me to price discount. I said, no, 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 no. We're going to get their eyes off the price. Yeah. And he said to me, just like that greater building society with the free holiday, the free vacation. I said, yeah, exactly. He had seen all the TV ads on TV. And I said, yeah. I said, what do you think landscapers, which are all males, like? And he goes, I don't know. You tell me. I said, they like beer. They love beer. And he said, yeah, of course they do. Now, it's a blue singlet industry. That's what they like. And I said, look, they normally drink a regular beer, but how about we offer them a premium beer? A premium beer and uh, he goes go on and I said what we'll do is send out a mail campaign to them because these guys are not net savvy they're not online savvy because the industry they're in so they're going to open up an envelope but they won't necessarily go to a website yeah. and what we'll do is say to them uh, there's a very premium beer here in Australia called Crown Lager which is a very upmarket beer and we'll give them a carton of Crown Lager which is about 24 bottles and normally at the you know liquor store you'd probably pay fifty dollars for this particular box of beer yeah. we'll give that to them absolutely free for every 500 square meters of grass mm. that they order because landscapers who are built are looking after the you know homes that might be 10 at a time or 20 at a time they're going to buy volume yeah. he said oh i don't i don't know that would work they're all interested in price discount i said let's give it a shot so what we did is send out a mail campaign with a beautiful big photo of the beer and it said, for every one home's worth of grass, which is about 500 square metres, we'll give you a carton of beer. He rang up eight days into the campaign and said to me, um, uh, I'm in trouble. And I said to his name's John Kelleher. I said, what's wrong, John? He said, we've run out of grass. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what? He said, all six miles have gone. When I visited him and he asked, I asked him how much turf did he have, he said, look at the mountain that way the mountain that way well it went on for miles he said that's how much i've got wow he said it's all it's all empty it's all brown and i said what are you doing he said i've actually got to source my turf from other turf farms to keep wow. up with the demand for the beer that's amazing so the thing is is that you won't get that response from a branding campaign he could have sponsored uh, uh, half a dozen netball teams and football teams and tennis clubs and he could have put ads on the side of buses and the backs of taxis for the next 12 months and he wouldn't have got five percent of that response yeah yeah. It all goes back to those five things. You know, you're always thinking of what's the profitable segment and then what's that wow factor is going to take their eye off the, off the price. Um, and, and problem, problem, problem solution. Yeah. We said to them, look, the problem you have as a landscaper is getting good constant supply of quality grass, but also getting some benefit for yourself out of that. And of course, you know, every time they buy a, a 500 square meters of grass, they got another cart in the beer. In fact, one landscaper who he said was the biggest pain in the backside up until then, because he always wanted a discount, rang him up and said, I need 22 homes worth of grass. Don't worry about when the grass gets here. I've got a party Friday night. I need the beer by Friday. <laughs> I love and, it. and so if. Therefore, yeah. you tick the box of the most profitable um, customer. You tick the box of the wow factor. You tick the box of the problem solution. Uh, website, um, I must say that in that particular instance, it didn't um, matter. Yeah, it didn't matter because of the blue signal audience. But he did yeah. trick up his website to feature the beer. But I mean, the, 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 it was a brochure campaign and the letter that really did it for him. Yeah. And then number five, repetitive trade. Well, where do you think these landscapers are going to go to get their grass? They're not, they're not going anywhere else. Right, right. And so you also worked with a tea company. So yep. what did you do with them? Uh, tea companies called Madura Tea, M-A-D-U-R-A, -A, Madura Tea. And in Australia, they would be the equivalent to Twinings in England. So it's the very, excuse me, upmarket tea. <laughs> and uh, right. so they're up against, uh, you know, regular price brands and they would pay, you would pay $10 for a box of, I don't know, 50 or 100 tea bags from Madura. You'd pay half of that for a regular brand in the supermarket. And they said to me, look, um, we've been getting pressure put on us by the big supermarket chains, Woolworths and Coles, to actually contribute more subsidy money to their catalogues. And JD, we've got to tell you, when we've done that, it makes no difference to our sales. You know, we give Woolworths or Coles $50,000 to, you know, put our box of tea in their catalogue, and it does nothing. Mm -hmm. And they said, we'd like to redirect that money into doing our own thing, and uh, rather than being lost in a 48-page 48 48 catalogue. I said, okay, mm -hmm. right on. So what we did there is that we gave everybody the chance to win a million dollars. And you might be saying to me, well, how did they come up with a million dollars? They don't need to. 
uh, I can get anyone in the world a million dollars for 16,000 bucks. Okay. And, and I'm just waiting for let's you to do go. it. Yeah, let's How do, do you it. do it? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, can get half, yeah. I can get you a half a million dollars prize for $8,000, and I can get you a quarter of a million dollars prize for four grand, and so on it goes, right? What it is is that uh, I deal with an insurance company, which is worldwide. Um, and they provide uh, what we call uh, uh, insured prize promotions. And so therefore, uh, who wants to be a millionaire on, on TV? They don't give that money away. That's given away by the insurance company. Yeah. So the TV network, whether it's NBC or whoever it is, they don't give that money away, okay? Uh, so when Regis Philbin over those years, you know, had the whole thing, uh, I, I think it's still on. Is Millionaire still on your TV? I mean, I know the reruns. I don't know if the, there's new episodes. Well, we still do have it here in Australia. Who wants to be a millionaire? So therefore, the insurance companies fund all of these shows. And uh, what I did was that I said to them, look, a million dollars will cost you $16,000 for a one in 250 probability. And what that is, is that at the end of the promotion, when you draw Mrs. Smith's name out, she gets to come to your boardroom or to a you know, function center. And on the boardroom table will be 250 envelopes. And she chooses one of those 250 envelopes. And if she chooses the one with the million dollars in it, then the insurance scrutineer, who was there at the time, hands over the check. One if in she, 250 chance is a pretty good odds, though. Why? It beats a lot. It beats a lottery. Yeah. Yep, beats the lottery. And uh, so, therefore, I run this for many, many clients, and it works like a dream every time uh, because they get the Elvis found headline of, you know, you could win a million dollars, but they're yeah. paying 16 grand. Right. Uh, or a quarter of a million dollars, and they're paying four grand. So it's, it's incredible. So what happens at the end of the draw, the person that's been pulled out in the preliminary draw gets to come to your boardroom or to some function center, and in a barrel or, or, or pegged up on the wall or maybe just spread out over the table, the representative of the insurance company has put the million-dollar check inside one of those 250 envelopes. Mm. Inside the other 249 is a consolation prize, and that might be a trip for two to Hawaii. Okay, yeah. You can't give away a crummy consolation prize if you yeah. gave away a pencil case then whoever gets that will stab you through the eye with a pencil <laughs> it's, it's, it's got to be got to be you a sound like it's happening before <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's got to be a little motor car or, or vacation to hawaii or something like that six months worth of groceries or something that's decent anyway right so how it worked for the turf farm uh sorry sorry yes yeah, so how it worked for madura i've got on the wrong subject uh for madura tea was in every time they actually bought a box of tea, inside the box of tea was a sweepstakes ticket that I designed. And on that sweepstakes ticket, it had a 10-digit number, and it might be 7430121. And the last two digits, which said 04 or 08 or 09, represented the number of entries that you won, okay, or you got from I that see. box. So okay. therefore, it was, a, it was a true lottery. So therefore, when you actually uh, got the box and you pulled out your little sweepstakes ticket, a 10-digit number and it had a circle in the last two digits, and I had uh, 04 at the end, meant I got four entries. What I had to do is go online and type in those 10 digits mm -hmm. with the last two digits, yeah. and immediately against my name, I'd be credited with four entries. Yeah. And if I bought another box that day and the last two digits were I'd buy over, boxes for sure, yeah. You know what was happening? We had, uh, because I could check online all the time and see what number of entries were coming through, yeah. they uh, they added to their database within uh, 10 weeks 52,000 contacts yeah. because wow. obviously they had to put all their details online. Yeah. So imagine the amount of extra product they can sell them. But more to the point, we created binge buying because there were some people buying 26 boxes of tea a day just to get more entries. For sure. So the, the, the X factor that, dashed X factor, which I've gone on about, um, is that when I designed this forum, I didn't design it whereby I just, you know, basically put the barcode number online and you get an entry. That meant every time you bought a box, you got one entry, one entry, one entry. What I did was turn the box into a slot machine yeah. because when you pulled your sweepstake ticket out, you might get one, two, five, seven, nine, ten entries. It didn't, you didn't know what you were going to get, right. which then resulted in binge buying because yeah. they felt that the box was a slot machine. I love that. That's fantastic. So why aren't more people doing that? Um, mate, I think it's because they, I mean, let's face it, most people go into business um, with an operational mindset. You would be so surprised how many businesses come to me at the 11th hour when they're on their deathbed mm. and asking me to do a David Copperfield. 
Yeah. And I have to say to them at the time, I'm not David Copperfield. You should have came to me six months earlier. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying you can't every now and again pull a rabbit out of your hat and help those people. But generally speaking, if they're on their deathbed, they don't have the budget to do a lot of these things. And so, therefore, most people don't do it because most people in business are operationally minded, not marketing minded. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, you know, I think a, a good thing that I should say here for anyone listening is that I believe in business you need either one of three advantages. Just just one of three advantages will get you through. Number one, you need a product advantage, and not many of us have that. Okay, so that's uh, that's Steve Jobs. That's the iPhone. He's yeah. got a product advantage. Yeah. Number two, a systems advantage, and not many of us have that because McDonald's have that where they can get a pimply-faced 16-year-old to say, do you want fries with that? Disney have a systems advantage in their parks, but most of us don't. Yeah. And if you don't have a product advantage and you don't have a systems advantage, well, you better make sure you have a marketing advantage. And that's where I come in. So yeah. somebody who's got basically a vanilla business that's the same as everyone else's business, I can give some chocolate and strawberry to that by saying, listen, you don't have a product advantage, you don't have a systems advantage, let me show you how to, how to have a marketing advantage. Yeah. And the classic example of that is Richard Branson with Virgin Airlines. He's got the same aeroplane as everyone else around the world, but guess what? I don't know how he does it, but he has basically Miss World hostesses. And he has bikini girls painted on the front of the nose of the plane. He just understands how to market like nobody else, right. and he's grabbed market share. In Australia, Richard Branson's um, Virgin Airlines have wiped Qantas off the map because he knows how to market, and they are too busy in operational procedures. Yeah. So... JD, you go from that to helping a menopause clinic. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about that. Tell, switch gears to that for a second. I don't know how I'm going to do that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's a lady. Uh, there's a lady here in Australia. Uh, she's uh, 69. I think she just turned 70 years of age, and uh, she's a very, very uh, clever doctor. Yeah. Uh, who specialises in helping women with menopause. Yeah. And, uh, and she's also a lawyer from a past life, so she's a very, very smart person. Yeah. And she wants to retire over the next uh, few years because she's, um, she's, she's getting to the age where she wants to put her feet up. And she was frustrated because her menopause clinic was only running at about 50% occupancy. And so she came to join one of my programs and she learned the wheel of wow and the whole problem solution scenario. Mm -hmm. And uh, ironically, she went out and she put together uh, a uh, letterbox campaign. Uh, most of her tr uh, uh, clients would come from within five, ten miles of her surgery. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. Cl clinic, I should say, not surgery. Yeah. And so she put a letterbox drop out and she showed me the letterbox drop. Well, she ticked all my boxes, you know, problem solution, creating yourself as the expert and so on and so forth. But she had her sister-in-law put the artwork together. OMG. <laughs> okay. Uh, it, was, it was just awful. And so, therefore, what I said to her was that, listen, it's not just about the concept, the direct response wheel of wow. Right. It's also about the execution. You want to make sure that you are going to execute my system to suit your target audience. It's what I call message to market match. Yeah. So if I said to you, Jeremy, and you had a, let's say that you enjoyed driving BMWs and Mercedes, and so you were at that level, and then I started to talk to you in a normal, regular family sedan language, you would just check out. You wouldn't be listening to me. Right. So what she did, she took my direct response formula and she dumbed it down because of her sister-in-law being a pretty basic artist. And I wish I had the before and after to show you, um, but when I'm doing my seminars, I show what her sister-in-law did to my mm. philosophy, completely yeah. destroyed it. Yeah. And then I show what happened when I introduced it to my artist. Yeah. Now, you can imagine over the years of doing this, I've got a bank of graphic artists and web people and copywriters and people that I just deal with who understand my mantra. So they mm. just get it. Uh, so therefore, uh, I said to her, listen, let me fix it. So we put it onto one of my artists and we put this campaign together and we basically said, are you suffering from menopause? Uh, well, by the way, the other thing too is that I said to her, you think you only get people from five or ten kilometres around your clinic. Can I ask you, do you get people coming in from uh, far away? She said, oh, look, I'm so good at this. I'm the number one expert in Australia. She's on the Today Show of the morning and all that sort of stuff. So she definitely is the the, the Steve Irwin crocodile hunter of her industry. So she's the expert. Yeah. And she said, look, um, I get people flying in from north of Australia and from Melbourne, which is, a, you know, another two hours flight. Yeah. She said, because I'm the best. I said, whoa, 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 hang on. Are you saying then that really you're so good that people will come from anywhere? She said, yeah. I said, okay. Well, what do you charge at the moment? She said, $75. I 
per 17-minute consultation. I said, good, we'll double that. And she <laughs> fell off a chair. She went, what? What? I'm 50% occupancy at the moment. I'm going to scare people. I said, no, 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 no. What we'll do is I'll fix your artwork. We'll position it so that that goes out into the exclusive suburbs of the Gold Coast, which might be 20 minutes away rather than 10 minutes away. But nonetheless, they'll, you've got menopause problems. You're going to travel 20 minutes, trust For me. For sure, no. yeah. I, I know because I've got menopause. <laughs> and uh, when I was writing the copy, do you suffer from you know sexual dysfunction? Do you have headaches? Are you grumpy? Are you moody? I'm thinking, hang on, I've got menopause. <laughs> um so anyway, we, 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 let's say we classed up the brochure. We made it look like it was the, the Hilton Hotel of, of brochures. Yeah. We put it out into the very upmarket suburbs. Do you know that she went from 50% occupancy to 100% booked for the next three months within a week of putting the brochure out? Wow. And only one person complained about the price going from 75 to 150 And the reason that only one person complained is that that one person was part of her existing database. What we've done is created a whole new database of rich people yeah. because I asked her, do rich people get menopause as well? And she said, yes. No, I said, they're immune. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, they, they've paid someone to get rid of I, I said, well, if rich people get menopause as well, let's just target rich people who get menopause. You don't want to talk to the poor people, okay? You want people who are going to pay $150 per 17 minutes, not 75 yeah. And here we are now, probably 18 months later, because this was about 18 months ago, she's booked solid all the time well, with people who, who have a, a, a Gucci purse. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Love that. I had to bring up the menopause clinic because it's just – so opposite of the other stuff. Um, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, Jeremy, I wait, I, 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 at the moment I've got five sex shops as clients, okay? I've got a lady uh, who's uh, concentrating on incontinence for women. And, of course, I've got Dr. Maura McGill, which is the menopause clinic. I know way too much about women. Yeah, so what way do you do about the, with the sex shops? Oh, you don't even want to go there. You don't, that, that is, that is so a Does your job. wife get mad, like see what you're working on and suspect that maybe you're not doing work or what? What? Let, let me tell you this because it's only you and me I know no one else is watching this exactly um, okay this was funny I'm at a seminar a lady comes up to me at the end of it she buys into one of my programs and she, what, this particular program means that we have a Skype call uh, within a week or thereafter right she said look I'm on the Gold Coast but I come from Perth which is almost like she's in Los Angeles but she comes from New York okay she said is there any chance I can meet with you this afternoon just for 20 minutes because it's going to be more easy to get my message across than if we do it Skype, Skype. I think she just wanted a one on one uh, meeting straight away I said yeah look okay let's do it so I sit down with her this is stupid. This is how stupid I am, by the way. Um, I sit down with her, and I've got my notepad, so I've got my ready to do this. And um, she's sitting. Now, she's a lovely lady, but a middle-aged lady. She certainly didn't look like a pimp, which is what you're going to find out in a minute, right? Um, and she's got a secretary sitting next to her. And uh, I go, look, what's the name of your business? She said, oh, um, privategirls.com. And I went, okay. Now, I'm reasonably streetwise. I'm I'm pretty blokey, so I've been around the block a few times, but it, it didn't click with me that privategirls.com was what you know it is. I just thought it was a private girls' school. And I, I got thought, you. Oh, okay. It must be a private girls' school. So, so anyway, we were sitting down, me with this mindset, private girls' school. I said to her, so could you tell me uh, what's your target audience? And she goes, um, no, sorry, sorry. So what, what's your main aim? She goes, I want more visits to the website. Okay, more visits to a website. Okay, I'll just get that down. Uh, and how many visitations are you getting at the moment? She said, oh, 52,000 a week. And I went, gee, I'm in my mind. I mean, pretty popular private school. Very you know, popular, yeah. I said, okay, who's your target audience? And she goes, she looked at me like I was an idiot. And she just said, any guy over 18 with a pulse. And then the penny dropped. <laughs> <laughs> Wait how good this business model is. Privategirls.com. Uh, it might be .com.au, okay, because it's in Australia. But anyway, right. what happens is that the girls, she has 400-odd girls on her books, and when you go onto this website, you come up with a checkerboard, and then you press number 62 or 84, whatever it was that you, you know, want to press, and that takes you through to a landing page, and this girl tells you what she'll do for $2,000 or whatever it is, right? And I had to research the site, obviously, <laughs> to recommend things for it. How many times do you think my teenagers walked into my office? Oh, gosh. I could not explain it away. I kept on saying to my wife when my teenagers would go out and say to my wife in the kitchen, Dad's on that dirty site again. <laughs> you have viruses <laughs> on the computer. Things are popping up. <laughs> not that I know. but no. um... <laughs> So, J.D., what about campaigns that didn't work and why? 
Unless all your campaigns have always worked all the time. Yeah, of course. Yeah, right, right. I wish, I wish. Um, look, the ones, uh, nothing specific perhaps uh, comes to mind in terms of a particular campaign, but the ones that have not worked, um, c- keep in mind the role that I play uh, these days is one of a coach. And so, therefore, um, because I've cut my IP into bite-sized pieces and made it very affordable for you know small to medium businesses, yeah. um, no longer am I getting paid you know, from some of the big businesses, tens of thousands of dollars a month, uh, these people are coming on board for a lot less than that. And a coach stands on the sideline and tells the team to kick the ball. A consultant gets on the field and kicks the ball. Right, okay. Right. And so when you're a coach and you're not being paid the big, big dollars, you can't go on the field and play. You've just got to tell the business owner, sure. you do this, you do that, you do that. Generally speaking, the ones that don't work purely and simply are not necessarily because the idea um, – Sorry, the system is broken because I've proven the system time and time again. It's because they don't join the dots. They don't do it. So, so for example, Dr. Maura McGill, the menopause lady, um, she broke my system because she followed that wheel of wow formula, but she got her sister-in-law to put the artwork together that looked like a bag of bones. It looked terrible. Whereas once I put the proper art uh, together and it looked up market, looked classy, uh, then, of course, it worked like a dream. So yeah. I guess the best way to answer that is that, yes, of course, there's been ones that don't work. But generally speaking, it's not because of the system. The system works every single time if you join the dots. It's because they've left out one or two components of the system mm-hmm. or they've given it to their brother-in-law to do the artwork. Mm-hmm. So it's people basically not listening. Yeah, pretty much, mate. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Um, is there a common much. one people fight you on? Like is when it you, common? A common one of the you know, uh, mistakes people make, is there a common, uh, one of the methods that people will fight you on because they don't agree with it or for whatever reason? Yep. Yep. Okay. Most of the time it comes back to that first quadrant in that wheel of wow. And it comes back to the very first quadrant. And that quadrant is, um, find your most profitable customer. And so therefore what they do, because everything else will just fall apart. It will never work if you haven't identified your target audience. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, um, if I've got that, uh, that, uh, turf farm chasing mum and dads who might want to change their front lawn, well, that's trying to push water uphill. That's hard yards. Mm -hmm. Whereas the easy audience, I'll give you a look, a great example. A great example is a client that came on board just recently. Um, uh, about six weeks ago. Um, sorry, no. No, he came on board just in the early part of December. Um, he's a fun park, and this fun park happens to be in uh, Melbourne, which is one of the major cities of Australia. And it's not by any means SeaWorld that you would see in Florida, but it's a water-themed park, and it's quite nice. Yeah. And when I went to visit him, uh, because he bought up a private uh, 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 consultancy with me, uh, and when they do that, then, of course, I go and visit the client rather than a Skype call, I was impressed. I thought it was going to be you know, a pretty folksy little fun park with maybe weeds and the garden that wasn't done properly. It was almost Disney-fied in terms of the landscape mm. and the gardening. Nowhere near Disneyland, of mm. course, because it was a just relatively you know small acreage. But nonetheless, he's got the big pirate ship ride and he's got some little mini roller coasters and he's got the beautiful little sandy beach, which has got the you know the little waters jumping up in the spurt. And then he's got this fantastic water slide that comes down from the mountain. And I said to him, wow, look at that. He goes, don't mean, JD, don't even bring it up. That was the biggest waste of $2.5 million I've ever had. I said, what? He said, I bought it in last Christmas, and it was supposed to send the place wild. It's what they call a, a cannonball water slide, and you've got them in all your theme parks where the kids come screaming down, loop, loop, loop. They get to a big breakfast bowl. They spin around the breakfast bowl and then go through the next hole and end up in the pool at the end of it. He said, uh, it's the longest cannonball water slide in the world, and it's done nothing for me. Bzz, freeze frame. What did you just say to me? Now, it's a family-owned theme park, and he goes, it's the longest cannonball water slide in the world. I said, it's not on any of your paraphernalia. I've looked at all your leaflets. It's not on there. And he goes, no, well, that would be my wife's problem. She's an accountant. And I said, I said, what? And his wife's with us, by the way, and her name's Liz. I said, what's wrong? She said, oh, look, I just don't want to take the risk of really uh, building expectations really high and then finding people might be a bit underwhelmed. We had a couple of complaints last year where people came here and didn't think the park was as good as we said it was on TV and they complained. I said, so you're designing your marketing campaign around two people who complain. And I looked at the husband. I said, you know what you've got to do to fix this? And he said, what? I said, sack your wife. 
um, <laughs> and divorce her. Get her out of your life, right? So anyway, good advice. We'll bring you yeah, in. Good she, uh, she gave me a couple of jabs in the shoulder and uh, said, oh, you thing, you know. Anyway, all jokes aside, they decided to let me have my rope and we got some drones in and took aerial photography of kids coming screaming down this water slide and the advertisement on TV just before Christmas, oh, I've got to tell you this. I said to him, what's your numbers last year? He said, well, between Christmas and the first couple of weeks of the new year, it's, it's our hottest season in Australia. It's 100 degrees every day, right? We're the opposite to you, of course. I love it. And uh, he said, we did about 1,200 people a day and we'd love to get up to fifteen or 1,600. I went, okay, I reckon that'll be pretty achievable. So we changed his ad. His TV ad the year before had these little children. You know when you go to Universal Studios, the little water spurts up from the cement and the kids put their feet on it, yeah, try and yeah. stop the water? That was his ad. And there were half a dozen kids holding up an uh, F, a U, uh, a N, a F, but whatever Sunfield spells. One had the F, one had the U, one had the – and they were trying to step on the water, you know, stop the water. Being, and the ad went something like this. Fun fields, fun fields, come to fun fields. Like it was so infantile. <laughs> and it may have attracted the 30-something mums with little kids, but it certainly wasn't going to get any children over eight pulling the sleeve of their parents saying, I want to go on that water slide. So we changed the ad. And when the aerial shot took all of these kids screaming down the water slide, the voiceover went something like this. We dare you to ride the scariest, the longest, the most thrilling water slide on the entire planet. It's called Typhoon and so on and so forth. You get the drift. Yeah. I've got a voicemail for him, from him that I now play at my seminars and his name is John as well. And it goes like this and it's Boxing Day. It's the day after Christmas. The TV ad hit the day before and he's exasperated. Right, he wanted fifty. He wanted to go from twelve hundred to sixteen hundred people a day, and his voicemail went something like this: "JD, JD, it's John here. I don't know what the hell we're doing, but it's working. We have a six-mile traffic jam down the road." Wow. He, he said it's quarter past nine, and we've got four thousand six hundred people already crammed into the park. This is insane. Now, over the next two weeks, his average was 4,000 a day. He wanted to get to 1,600. Wow. What we did is that we injected some wow factor adrenaline into the entire yeah. marketing. So we took his sleepy sort of TV commercials and made it Disney and put some Space Mountain behind it. But moreover, what we did is we went through that wheel of wow formula. I identified where his most profitable audience was. Guess where they were? The most profitable audience were not little yummy mummies with just little three-year-olds. They were parents who had little ones but over eights as well. Right. And right. guess guess who do you think's the most influential child, the three year old or the nine or twelve year old? The one who can talk. More. The one that can talk. <laughs> yeah. And so I won't bore you with the rest of the wheel of wow, but we went through that wheel of wow formula. Now he joined all the dots and I've got a testimonial video on my website from him where um I had to tone it back because he used a couple of rich words in there, um, but basically said this thing so and so works. And he is a classic client who I just love because they get out of the way and they just join the dots. Yeah. And JD, so, yeah, so thanks for sharing. That's amazing. I love that. And uh, what should people know about your book? I have to have you show your book and talk about it for a second. Yes. Well, this is me being awfully boastful. And thank you very much for making that sound like it was just off the top of your head. When, when in fact, I said that I've got the book here, you better bring no, it up. No, actually, uh, I had it in my notes to make sure uh, you showed this. Okay. So look, uh, most people when they are writing a book, write one around about that size, which is fair enough, and that's one of mine, How to Wow, and, of course, you can see who's on the front cover. I've decided that I would put that guy on the front cover. Um, but when I thought, look, if I'm supposed to be this wow factor guy, I better practice what I preach. Yeah. So, therefore, I put together this thing called the Wow Manifesto. Yeah. And uh, you can Wait, see... Wait, so hold the other book up compared to it, just so... Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this one here, the big one, is, uh, as you can see, leather bound and it's a beautiful cover. Um, so that you understand the message to market match thing uh, a little better, Jeremy, is that my brief to my art studio for this one was um, Walt Disney meets Harry Potter at the Palazzo Versace Seven Star Hotel. Yeah, I feel like so you open my, it like gold is going to shoot out of it or something. You got it. Yeah. You got it. And on my videos where I promote this book, that's exactly the silly stuff that I do. Okay. So so what happens is that uh, in this particular book, this consists of around about 20-something uh, years of all of my most successful campaigns. Yeah. And so through here, this is a gigantic swipe file of all of the campaigns that have worked over the years. I have, um, I have a... A system for my clients that works like this, uh, Jeremy, basically what I do is that I, I have a system for them called the Client Attraction Phenomena System, 
and I won't show and tell with that, but basically it's an online training program where I give them the wheel of wow formula and show them just what to do with it. Mm -hmm. And I show a few case studies like, you know, the ones that we've discussed here. Yeah. When they've finished that program, they jump onto this one and I've got this online as well. Yeah. And what this is is a swipe file of clients who have used my program, the Phenomena one, and have actually executed it very well. So one is training what to do. Yeah. This one is actually how to do it. So where can people find that or get that? Uh, everything's on my website. So it's the Institute of wow .com. Yeah. Uh, Okay. So uh, it's an international um, URL. So there's no AU like we normally have in Australia. We always yeah. put AU after the .com, but it's the Institute of wow yeah. .com. So can people order the hard copy? Yes, they can. Uh, they can order the hard copy on top of the online version. So we have this available in a program online. So therefore, they can just obviously, you know, have it on their smartphone or on the computer and they can print out what they want. But if they want the hard copy of the book, they can uh, they can order that as well. All right. Well, if I come to Australia, I'm, I'm picking one up. I don't think you ship to the US, do you? Uh, we do. No, absolutely, mate. We have clients all around the world uh, you? that, you know, to get the book and uh, all we do is get you to sign an insurance policy so that if you're reading it in bed of a night time and you fall asleep and break a rib <laughs> um, that you will not sue us yeah. i'll sign can, it i'll sign it yeah can, can you imagine can you imagine trying to read this in bed in fact what i, I would to do, read that in bed yeah <laughs> <laughs> what i wanted to do i wanted to actually get on an airplane and with the book, I haven't done it yet, but I want to do a Seinfeld episode myself and get on an airplane and just get this out and start reading it. <laughs> so what was, you know, I was curious, obviously, you know, when we come, you come up with something like that, it's maybe not the first idea out of the, right, right off the bat. What, what was on the chopping block? What did you think of that was going to be a wow factor that didn't make it? In terms of the book? Yeah, in terms of the book. Yeah, yeah, I okay, okay. Well, uh, I'll tell you how it came about. Jeremy, I was having a beer uh, with a very good mate of mine, um, Glenn, Glenn, his name is, and he's a nut like I am, so therefore we're always dreaming up stupid things. And um, I said to him, look, um, I, I had written this one. I'd written this normal little book here, which is, it's, it's, it's good. I mean, it's your thirty four ninety five book, and, you know, it's on my website too, as he gives a, a, a plug. Um, but I said to him, look, I've got so much of this stuff. I mean, as much and all as that sounds like a real boastful, you know, um, being a show off, but I have, I've got so much of these case studies, I can't fit it into just one of these things. And he said, oh, well, he said, what you've got is a manifesto. And I went, yeah, that's a good word. It's a little bit wanky, but yeah, that serves me, okay. Um, manifesto. And I said, well, I'm going to have to put it in something that's gigantic. And then he said, well, why don't you? So typical buddies, you know, pushing each other. Right. I said, why don't you? And that's what happened. So I went home and what I do, I thought I'd show you when I'm putting together because oh, cool. of my art background, if I'm putting together sketches for Did you do that? Web, yeah, these are all the ones. I, I do half a oh, dozen wow. of these a day. So these are all homepage layouts for websites. Oh. And uh, you can see there's quite a few. I've just grabbed these out of my tray, but there's only four gazillion of them. But so when businesses come on board with my program, I quickly show them how to fix their website. So oh. therefore, uh, I'll just flick through a few of these so you get a feel for, you know. These all work on the same wheel of wow. These are brochures, they're not websites, but uh, this is, happens to be a client at the moment who's running a radio DJ school and he wants to uh, pull up banners for an expo that he's doing. So that's just what that is. So anyway, what would happen is that I came back and I would um, sit down and i sketch up the book and then I had the local tabloid newspaper next to me at the time and I looked at my sketches. So therefore, let's just say for argument's sake, um, give me a second, let's just say... Just to say I, I had a sketch like that sitting next to me. That happens to be a web page, so it's not the book. Uh, I looked at the tabloid newspaper and I picked up the tabloid newspaper and thought, hang on, why do yeah, that's an idea. Let's make a book the size of a tabloid newspaper. And that's how it came about. Love it. Yeah. Oh, by the way, the other thing, the, the other thing uh, is that that particular book, this one here, that's the back cover, by the way, but this book here uh, last year, one, uh, the printer that produces this in uh, Canberra, which is the capital of Australia, down towards Sydney. The printer that produces this rang me up very excited at about 11 p.m. one night on a Friday night and said, JD, I want to tell you something. I said, what? He said, I never told you, but I put the book in the National Australian Print Awards and just anything that's been printed the entire year from, you know, basically um, Macy's catalogs through to supermarket brochures to, you know, booklet. He said, everyone's in it. He said, we just won the gold award. In other words, the Academy Award for printing in Australia for wow. 2014 with your book. That's cool. Yeah. Wow. 
So I said to him that he owed me a carton of that premium beer. Yes. So JD, I always ask, you know, since it's Inspired Insider, tell me about your lowest moment and how you pushed forward. Uh, yep. Okay. 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 Um, look, I yeah, the the lowest moment that I've had. I mean, I'm pretty jovial and 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 muck about, and I'm your typical larrikin. Um, and so most of my time, I'm up. Um, in fact, Valentine's Day has just passed, and one of my good mates. Um, that is, you know, he's in his 50s like I am and he's been around a while. He has no idea, but I'm the one that's been sending him those dirty Valentine's <laughs> Day cards for the last 30 years. <laughs> From the private and, ladies' website. <laughs> oh, mate, look, it's just amazing. I mean, he lives in Sydney and I live on the Gold Coast. We're an hour flight away from each other these days, but uh, we grew up together and we're both larrikins and most of my friends are all stupid. And um, he, uh, he doesn't realise it, but, you know, over the years when he would have a beer with me, the, you know, three days after Valentine's Day, he'd say to me, look what I got. And it's the card I've sent him, of course. <laughs> and uh, he goes, look, she wants to put chocolate all over me and lick it off, you know. And I went, wow, boy. So if I if he ever finds out that I'm doing that, I've got to sleep with one eye open. I, won't, the rest of my I life. won't send this to him. <laughs> yeah, please. Yeah. No, he, look, he, he, he's a concreter, so I don't think he'll be listening into your program. But anyway, so therefore my life's full of um, larrikins and uh, and people who just enjoy life and have a good time. So that's pretty much my persona, and I mess around with nuts like me. Um, but, yeah, there was a low time, and that was back in um, uh, the mid-'90s. Um, and what had happened is that I was producing a lot of the bubblegum trading cards here in Australia uh, for Aladdin and Beauty and the Beast and Lion King and uh, Schwarzenegger movies and all that sort of stuff. And you guys in America have grown up on baseball and basketball bubblegum cards, so you yeah. know what I'm talking about. Yeah, exactly. And I had taken over that industry in Australia. And wow. the reason I had is because the bubblegum company that had it before me just didn't realise how to market these trading cards. And I went backwards and forwards to your country, to the States, and learned how the baseball card phenomena worked and just brought it back for our sports here mm -hmm. in Australia. And what I did is take out the licenses for some of the big movies. Well, I was doing the Aladdin cards, and I had to fly over to see Disney and Burbank. And whilst I was away, the manager of my business made a massive printing mistake. And I won't bore you with the details, but basically he printed the cards upside down with wrong numbers and all sorts of things. They got distributed to all of the drugstores here in Australia for the kids to buy them, and we had to basically take the stock back and burn it because mm. everything was wrong. And we lost $2.2 .2 million in a week. Wow. And uh, so I had about 17 people working for me at the time, and uh, we had to cut that in half because the bank wanted to close me down. And uh, it was a pretty sad time. We lost our house and all the stuff that goes with it. And uh, a lot of entrepreneurs who are listening to this have probably been through the same thing, so I'm not the only one. Um, and I remember on one occasion when I had to take my family out of their home, and you wouldn't believe it, the day that we were leaving our home, which was a beautiful property in the country with a two-story house and a guest lodge and the little river with a canoe and tennis court, all the trappings that I had had because I'd been successful up at that point of time, we were losing that. And the day that we had to leave, would you believe, and I'll never forget it, I was driving the Tarago van with all the six kids in the back, uh, well, maybe four, I think we might have had four of the children then. I looked across at my wife and she would never say anything, but she had a tear rolling down her cheek. Oy. The day that I took her away from her home was Mother's Day. Oh, my gosh. You? So I felt pretty low, and uh, I remember I went into church one morning. Um, I'll never forget it. The two little children at the time who are in their 20s now, but they were five and six or seven at the time. I was taking them to school from this rented unit that we had because we couldn't afford to have anything else. And as it turned out, um, I was running late for school, and I forgot to put my seatbelt on, and the policeman pulls me up and books me for not having my seatbelt on. And I thought, well, that's terrific. We've just lost 2.2 .2 million the week before, and now I'm getting fined for not having a seatbelt. I put my foot down to get them to school on time, and another policeman pulled me over for speeding that morning. <laughs> Not a good morning. We got to school and uh, there was a church next to the St. Joseph School. And I thought, well, I'll go in and have a word to the big guy upstairs because, you know, look, like, this has got to stop, right? <laughs> so anyway, I get to the front door and the side door, what do you think? Locked, locked. So I remember looking up and saying, I, I think I'm getting the message. They're locking right? you out. Oh, my God. Yeah. So anyway, the priest actually saw me at the side door and uh, he said to me, what can I do for you? I said, oh, mate, I'd just like to get in and steal all the money from the poor boxes, but I can't get into the church, right? Wow. And I just mentioned to him, I wanted to get in to say prayer. And he said, uh, fine. So he opened up and uh, I went in and I just said a prayer to the big guy upstairs and just said, look, any chance at all, I don't want to be rich again. I don't want to be wealthy again. All I want is just put a roof over my kid's head and pay back my wife for this awful thing that's happened. And yeah. uh 
And I said, look, if that happens, I promise to pay back. Well, as it's turned out, you wouldn't believe it. Two weeks later, on the day that the bank was coming in to close the business up, because they said, you're not going to survive. I said, if I just get the rugby league trading cards, which would be like getting your NBL license for the trading card. If I can just get the N- uh, the, uh, the um, rugby league trading, I'll get all the money back in a year, I know. And uh, I pitched for the rugby league trading license with about six other companies. On the day that we were due to be closed up by the bank, I get a phone call from the rugby league. And the guy, Graham Clark, his name is, he said, listen, now keep in mind, I'd been at him and at him and at him because I knew this was my lifeline. And he must have got a thousand calls from me the two or three weeks beforehand. He rings me and he says, JD. I said, yep, I'm trembling, of course, because I know today's D-Day. He said, you've got the rugby league trading card license. And I went, "Oh, oh, thank you, thank you. And he said, but on one condition. I went, anything, anything. He said, you never bloody ring me again for the rest of your life. He said, you are the most annoying rat that I've ever come across. <laughs> I said, it's a deal. It's a deal. Wow. So we got the license. Uh, I knew how to market these things. I went to Rupert Murdoch's papers here in Australia and said, listen, how about I give you millions of football cards, trading cards to hand out on a Sunday paper? And that's what he did. And if they didn't find Elvis, the front page of the newspaper said, get your free trading cards for the football players in today's paper. All the kids would get their first two or three cards, taste test it run into the drugstore and buy my $2 packs. We took the rugby league trading cards in that one year because I got involved with News Limited newspapers giving away samples. They put $200,000 worth of TV on every time that they would put the cards out through their paper on the Sunday. They'd give me half a page on the front page and they'd distribute all the cards to all the drugstores around Australia. We went from $2 million to $12 million in one season just with the football cards. Wow. I paid all the money back to my creditors within that 12 months. And then after that, I ended up selling the business not long after that because I promised my wife that I would not let anyone else put our house at risk. At least if I made the mistake, I'd wear it. But to have a staff member do it, I wouldn't. So that's why I I brought the business back to what it is now, marketing consultancy. Yeah. But, But can I say this to you? At the end of that, I had to keep my promise to go upstairs. And so therefore, I said to Gail, my wife, can I just have six months off before I get back into doing whatever? Because we sold the business for more money than we ever hoped. Because obviously, when it was very successful, everyone wanted to talk to me. And so I, she said yes. So I went out and produced a TV program called Dreams Can Come True yeah. for the Channel 10 network here in Australia. And it ran on Sunday nights up against 60 Minutes and beat them in the ratings. Yeah. And what it was was delivering dreams for needy people who were down on their luck. And it was a wonderful six months of my period. Um, we ended up producing a number of these one hour TV shows. And uh, just if I could do that all over again, I'd do it yeah. tomorrow. What were some of your favorites? I have actually watched a few of them. They're phenomenal. Yeah. Which were your favorites? Well, look, uh, the TV network said to us, as much and all as they could see that it was very nice to make people's dreams come true, we had to have a celebrity element. Yeah. That wasn't part of my plan to start with, but I realized that for ratings, that's what we had to do. So there was one wonderful story that involved Michael Jordan, a little 15-year-old wheelchair Mm. basketball. I'm in Chicago, by the way, yep. Oh, you're in Chicago? Well, of yep. course, you know the Michael Jordan restaurant. Yep. Um, this little boy called Jay Campbell, he was uh, 15 years of age. In fact, just on 15, he actually met Michael Jordan on his 15th birthday. And this little boy tried to kill himself the year before. Oh, wow. And the local uh, minister uh, contacted us because we put the word out to the Starlight Foundation and Make-A-Wish Foundation and you know, the, all the churches. And this particular minister said, look, this uh, little boy would be a perfect for your TV show, Dreams Can Come True, because 12 months ago he tried to kill himself because he suffers from spina bifida and he just didn't see life was holding much for him and so therefore he was down in the dumps and that's what happened and fortunately he didn't uh, kill himself and uh, he took up wheelchair basketball and he said you wouldn't believe that talk about uh, uh, turning your life around um, this little boy on a normal wheelchair not even a sports wheelchair had become a member of the Australian under 16's wheelchair basketball team and if they scored 50 points he scored 40 wow. okay he was just a whiz and his name was Jay, and we actually visited him at the um, uh, at one of his games, whereby he was playing in this particular game. And he thought we were just doing a documentary on wheelchair basketball. We weren't. We were producing a, a story for this one-hour special. Yeah. And uh, as it turned out, we surprised him on that particular game. At the end of the game, when he's just sitting with all of his other team players in a row, we had a dolly track in front of him, and the cameraman stops in front of him, And his coach is reading from the platform and his coach says that all of you people who are playing wheelchair sport are an inspiration to us. But there's one in particular here uh, who's only 15 years of age who dreams for one day watching Michael Jordan play basketball. He just dreams of that day. But his parents have spent all their money on him. 
and they don't have the wherewithal to do that. Right. We've got some news for you. Now, the camera stopped in front of his face and there's tears rolling down his face because he knows it must be him. And he said, uh, Jay Campbell, you're off to Chicago next week with your father to watch mm. Michael Jordan play. That's amazing. Now, this was 95, by the way, so Michael Jordan was playing. As yeah. he wheels his wheelchair to the podium, the whole stadium has erupted and then there's a silence. And the coach says to him, if you're finding it hard to believe this, wait till you hear this. Um, you've got a luncheon invitation to have lunch with the biggest star on the planet, Michael Jordan, while well, the wow. entire stadium went nuts. Wow. How did I pull that off? Yeah. All I did when I got that dream, uh, it was back in the fax days prior to email, I sent a fax to Jordan's office and said, this is the story. Is there any chance that you could possibly get tickets to the game? And is there any chance you could meet him? When I got to Chicago and we pulled this dream off and we took the little boy to the Michael Jordan restaurant in Chicago, Michael Jordan took him to lunch. Wow. And I said to Michael Jordan, how did our fax get through the two million that you get every week? And he said, I happened to be walking past the machine, which I only do, I only call into the office once every three or four weeks. I was walking past the fax machine when your letter came out. He said, I just happened to pick it up and saw that you were from Australia and what a wonderful story this was. And he said, mm -hmm. I gave it to Susan, my secretary, and said, make this happen. Wow. That's unbelievable. So no, no one can can convince me that the big guy upstairs did not help me make that happen. I wanted to pay back. And I won't bore you with the other stories, but we had Princess yeah. Di do the same thing and Meatloaf and the X-Files people and uh, a lot of big star, Paul Hogan, the Crocodile Dundee. We had all of these people help us deliver these unbelievable dreams of people who didn't have homes, had got a home, people who needed yeah. transport, got a brand new car, uh, family reunions from you know, sisters that they hadn't seen for 20 years, all these wonderful things. And you know what it proved to me, Jeremy, is that despite the fact that we hear all of this bad news on TV and online at the moment, do you know that 98% of people out there are wonderful, giving people, but unfortunately the media just doesn't give them the column centimetres that they deserve? Yeah. There's not one person we asked to do something that never said yes. Not one. Not one. Every Whether it was Sylvester Stallone, Steven Spielberg, or whether it was the butcher or baker down the street or it was a home builder where we needed a home, yeah. every single person, when we told them the story of this person being in need and they needed a new car or they needed money for an operation or they needed their house rebuilt, every single person, celebrity or otherwise, otherwise said, yes, we're going to make this dream come true. So mm. i got to tell you, my lowest point in life ended up being one of my highs. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That is truly amazing. And uh, I'll have to link those videos up too. JD, I appreciate your time. I have one last question, but first tell people where they can find you. What do you have going on? What program should they check out? Thank you, mate. Thank you. Um, well, it's very kind of you to give me the opportunity to do that. Um, what I'd uh, like everybody to do is just get a whole bundle of cash and put it in a brown paper bag. <laughs> and if they could send it to this post office. Um, okay. Uh, what's the, mate, what's the post office? No. <laughs> Um, very simple, mate. The website is theinstituteofwow.com. So mm -hmm. it's pretty easy to remember, theinstituteofwow.com. Mm -hmm. And look, uh, I've just launched a brand new thing that I think everyone would love, and it's a six-week video training series on that Wheel of Wow. And uh, I've called it the Phenomena Program. Uh, so therefore, if they go to my uh, website, uh, they'll see details of that. It's basically a, a product which they can buy for I think it's under $1,000. I think it's 900 and something dollars. And what happens is that in their inbox, every Monday morning, they will receive a link to a one-hour video of me training them through that Wheel of Wow formula with lots of case studies. And obviously on this particular call, we couldn't show the menopause ladies before and after brochure. and We couldn't see the fun parks before and after TV commercial. Yeah. But that's we'll all part We'll link it up at you know, the instituteofwow.com backslash case dash studies people can check out um, that those some of those images. Great. Oh, yeah. well, look, I didn't realize that you could do that. So that's great, yeah. Jeremy. But, um, yeah, so look, the Institute of wow.com and it's all there. And uh, the great thing about the video series, I know I'm going on about that, um, but the thing is, is that that's something they can start immediately. And basically, mm -hmm. uh, every Monday morning in their inbox, they'll have a, uh, a link and that link would give them a one hour uh, tutorial video pretty much like this it's a bit cheeky it's not too formal um so i think that they'd probably find hopefully they found it enter training not just training yes so yeah everyone should check out the institute of wow and you, there's a lot of great resources free and paid which are all valuable um and last question jd is what should we leave people with do you have um some where should they start and you have a good uh, final story because you have so many good stories yeah look i i um 
uh, just a couple of things, uh, Jeremy. I normally say to people when I'm doing a seminar presentation, do you think you need a good product to make money? And <clears throat> the reason I'm saying this is because a lot of people listening or watching this will be saying, oh, yeah, look, I don't have a wheelbarrow that lights up in the dark. You know, I don't have an iPhone. I don't have a Rubik's Cube. What, there's nothing particularly different about my product. Um, and that's where this wow factor, you know, artificial wow factor stuff comes in because at the end of the day, the toy sells a lot of those McDonald's Happy Meal uh, boxes. Uh, and when I say to everyone, do you think you need a good product to make money? They all go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, no, you don't. Who thinks McDonald's makes the best hamburger in the world? Right. Nobody. But they just sold $24 billion worth of hamburgers in North America last year. And so that demonstrates that you don't need a good product. What you need is a good marketing system. And a lot of people say to me, oh, no, but a good operation system. I said, no, no, no. McDonald's have got a great operation system behind that counter. But if they didn't have people coming into the restaurant, there's no good having that. Okay, so therefore, it's the marketing system. That's what you've got to have is the good marketing system. And so my view and my advice to anyone watching this is that, you know, even if you don't think your product is the best in town, don't be too concerned about that. I mean, it's great if you've got a good product and good marketing, e.g. Disneyland. But if you don't have a product which you think is a, is a world beater, then don't be too fussed about that. It's all about the marketing. And I'm not suggesting for a moment that anyone should try and market a bad product. I'm not. But if you don't have a product that is the Rubik's Cube and you're worried about that, you sort of run on the mill, fine. Because what you can do is if you implement, well, a marketing system, obviously I'm going to vote for my Wheel of Whale version. But if you implement a proper marketing system, then, of course, it can still save that product and make you a lot of money. And the second thing I would suggest to anyone is hang around nuts. Okay. And Jeremy, it looks like, sounds and looks like another nut to me. So hang around him. Um, and the reason I'm saying that is because um, you want to hang around people who say, uh, why not? Not people who say, why? Because at this age, I've decided not to hang around the whys anymore. Because, you know, I'd come up, I'm an ideas person. So I'd say, what about this? What about that? What about that? What about that? What about an underwater restaurant? What about we do this? What? And I'd get these, you know, accountancy style people around the table. Oh, why? Why? And yeah. every now and again, when someone with an X factor will say, why not? I'll go, bang, you're going to be on my supplier list. So generally, I believe, yeah. hang around with why nots. And then the last thing would be, be the un of your industry. And that means be unusual or unlike. So just don't be like everyone else. When you're thinking through that you're a pharmacy or you're a butcher or baker or candlestick maker, think about what makes you the un, as in unlike everyone else. Yeah. JD, thank you so much. This has been hugely valuable, an absolute pleasure. I uh, really appreciate it. My pleasure, mate. It's been a real uh, buzz to me too. It's fantastic. And uh, if ever I'm in Chicago in the near future, then we'll have a beer or two. For sure, definitely. So, did, did you have you you have had a beer or two in your life, haven't you? A few, yeah. Okay. I don't think I can uh, out drink you though. <laughs> heavy reputation. I'm not too bad, but uh, Steve Plummer, who introduced me to you, well, he's got a problem. Yes, well, I'll talk to him about that. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. I appreciate it. My pleasure. All the best, mate.